Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 49. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Howdy. And another person named Mark. I am another person named Mark. On the podcast for the very first time. And if you're lucky, the last. (laughs) And we just finished PAX East 2019, where we focused on playing board games. And man, we played a lot of board games. It was board games all day, every day. All of them new? I don't think I played any game that I knew before going to PAX. You hadn't played Arboretum? I had not played Arboretum. I had played that. So I played, what, 17? No, counting today, where I played, I went and played some unpublished Magic. prototypes. Magic's the only thing that I played. Oh, Magic, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, that I had already played. I played previously. well, we played well over a dozen brand new games, not necessarily all light games either, and we're tired, but we're here to talk about those games. So I'm confused because I could have sworn this was a hockey podcast. Where the Penguins did win. Penguins There's your hockey making... news for the day. Peng- <laughs> Penguins are going to make the playoffs. Things will get a lot more exciting in the next month. I'll be back to report. Wow. Okay. Fun times. Anyways, <laughs> we've got 17-ish games to talk about. So I'm slightly terrified about how long this podcast will be, but I think we can be efficient. Yeah, there's a lot uh, of interesting we did stuff play... here. There, there's some groupings of games. We did play a lot of Euro games, so we have a lot of practice at being efficient at things. That was like I a mean, joke we were, I didn't even we were, commit to. We were generally not very good at being efficient. I mean, I was very efficient in that one yeah. game, but we'll get to that later. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, so how this is going to work, we have a couple of things we're going to talk about at first, and then we're going to do a list because the lists are fun, and it's going to be our top 16 games that we played yeah, at but, PAX East. But, These are the 16 games that we played, at least two of us played together, ranked from 16th to 1st. And overall, like, we were really happy with the games we played. We did, didn't play many bad games, if any. Of the games I played, again, excepting today with some of the prototypes I played, a couple of which were quite bad, but prototypes, you know, I wouldn't say any of the games that I played were bad. I would say a couple were mediocre, but I'm looking at the list here. Honestly, only number 16 I would actually call fairly mediocre. Everything else was good to great. Like, it was a really, really solid list of games we've got here. So, uh, I would say almost universally at least recommended to try out if we mention it. Yeah, so so lots of exciting stuff to talk about. Yeah. Even if it takes us three hours. Oh, please no. Let's go. I'm so tired. Let's go. Four hours. Ah. All right. Let's 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 talk about Magic the Gathering, though. Yeah. Because I've been playing Magic more online right. uh, recently because Arena is just a really great implementation of the game. And I've been enjoying it so much. And my thoughts about Magic as a game have improved because of it specifically in the limited formats. I think Constructed still has a lot of problems. Not a lot of problems. Constructed has some weird things that you kind of have to just find the Constructed thing that you like if you want to do Constructed because there's so many different flavors and they're all for different kinds of people. But I think Limited is where magic really shines. I think the drafting and the deck construction like on the spot with a semi-random or random set of cards is like peak magic. And I know, you know a lot of people disagree. But anyways, we played... A Matt and I played a sealed magic event, which was a qualifier for the championship there. If if one of us happened to go 4-0, I won't create any suspense. Neither of us <laughs> went 4-0. Although I think my deck might have been good enough, depending on my opponents. I had a very strong deck, I thought. It was it was sweet. And we had a blast at it. Yeah, like, this, was, this was just... A lot. This was probably the highlight of PAX for me. Just how much fun it was. Yeah. This was my first serious magic event. It, it, it was just so much fun. Everyone involved was so friendly. Like, that that was a real highlight for me. Even though, like, like I, you hear stories about really toxic people at, at events like this. I know they're out there. But, man, as a newbie playing in this, my opponents were all great. And, and yeah, I, I just agree 100% on the limited format. It's it's just a blast, the time pressure of, of uh, building something out of a limited set. Mm-hmm. And then it's go time. Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe the toxic stuff you would see maybe at 
even more intense events, although, you know, the PAX championship is is a serious thing. I think the judges are exceptionally well-trained, and people yeah, know that. for sure. Uh, to handle any kind of thing, they're, they're very kind. At least, you know, every judge that I saw was very kind, helpful, but able to speak precisely and commandingly when needed, uh, which is what you want in a judge for an event like that. And I think just because it's a convention... Everyone kind of knows there are going to be people there who are jumping in to do an event like that, even if they don't have tons of experience. Whereas if you have a situation like a local game store, it's the same group of people all the time. And if someone new comes in, that might ruin their or that might disrupt their little uh, social bubble they have. But I think a big part of the success of of this sealed event is that Ravnica Allegiance is just a great set for limited. Like, yeah. I've been drafting yeah. it a lot on Arena, and it is so fun. Every two-pair co- color combination that is focused on in the set has a really good deck within them. You can do a multicolor deck. There's specific things dealing with gates, uh, which are the multicolor land cards. Uh, that can become a very strong deck if you get the right cards. But everything seems fairly well balanced and interesting. The, the new mechanisms are interesting. I absolutely yeah. loved Ravnica Allegiance so much. Yeah, uh, this was fun for me because I'm a casual Magic player. I play once a year or, or something. So I know nothing of the new sets. I've never made a multicolored deck before. But basically, Mark, you gave me a rundown of like the top like four or five things to look out for if you get this. you got to got to pay attention yeah um, and i and i didn't get any of those so i just picked red green looked good to me i had some cards that i liked in red green so i just went for it it was yeah. super effective the cool thing that happened to me well i had a buy in the second round which was actually a bummer you're like okay i just paid i know because you want to play i paid for four matches but I, I had a buy but it was great for me because i could reevaluate my deck and that extra time was probably more valuable to me than other people so I, I ended up splashing into blue because um, I had a great rare card in blue that just didn't fit with anything else. And yeah, just the construction is is just so interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I'd recommend doing it even if you're a casual player. Absolutely, especially if you know you have you know a solid set of judges and or, or people running the event because that can that can help a lot. And Ravnica Allegiance in particular, I think is is wonderful. Like the previous set, Gates of Ravnica, or no, sorry, Guilds of Ravnica had the other five two color pairs that it focused on and it was fun but a couple of them were just clearly better than the others i think it was pretty universally agreed upon that boros uh which is red white and i can't remember demir uh, which is blue black were the two best in that set by a fairly wide stretch i don't see any clear winner of allegiance in terms of the the pairs i think what's it called simic i think is a bit more variant it has more variance with it but if you get the right cards it can be excellent i absolutely love it highly recommend it uh, i even went back and today uh when mark and matt were not attending at the end of the day they had a turbo draft which is you draft you do a normal draft and then it's just one round to see if you get a lot of tickets or just one ticket and drafting it was a blast I went into red green this time, but my limited deck was incredible because you get six packs or my sealed deck was incredible because you get six packs in sealed. And in the first four packs, I opened three black, white mythics or one black mythic and one and two of the same black, white mythic. I, for people who know about it, I got a spawn of mayhem first and then two seraph of the scales. And so I, basically looked closely or I looked quickly to see if there was any other colors I might consider and there were not and I was done constructing my deck in like 10 minutes it was just completely handed to me it's like well I just needed hold on till I get these cards and then win because they're flyers and they're very good so that was fun I ended up selling the one of the seraphs was a foil I ended up selling it to my fourth round opponent because I'd rather have the money to do more drafts than keep a card that I'm not going to ever play constructed with. Anyways, Magic was very, very fun. I'm I'm enjoying the game more and more. Can't wait for the next set, which apparently is going to be full of Planeswalkers, so we'll see how that goes. I think it's something they've never done before. Before we get to the list, Mm. I just wanted to point out one... So on on 
Thursday, because it's less crowded, I did all of my expo hall stuff, which is like 75 or 80 percent video games. And I like video games, but not as much as board games. So I take a glance and, you know, oftentimes it's very kind of the same games over and over. But I happened to stop by this one small booth for I think it was an indie studio. And the game was called Lemnus Gate, which is in a closed beta right now. And it is a first person shooter set in a time loop. Is that the? I guess that's the right, right yeah. way to explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You experience the same time over and over again. Yeah, so each side has different members of a team, you know, like a Team Fortress kind of thing, Every you know, different skills and guns and whatever. And it's turn-based, so the first person will choose a person. And in the one I was in, it was a capture the flag thing. So I just kind of ran out, captured the flag, returned it. And then my opponent chose someone and then experienced the exact same time that I did. And so he went out and shot me. And then so I had to figure out how to counter it. So like shoot his guy before he's able to shoot me or go for another flag. And so it was like half shooter, half puzzle, like multiplayer puzzle, tactical decision making. I thought it was really neat. I never heard of a game that has done that before, but it, it seemed very novel. Yeah, I like I I love the idea. I didn't get to play it. The only the only comparison I have was uh, Telos Principle. I think is the game that had some time loop puzzles. That it, yeah, it's just a cool thing that you can do. All right, let's get to our list. We're gonna count down the top sixteen games, or rather, we're gonna count down the sixteen games we played. At least two of us played. Almost all of them were all three of us. A couple of them were just the two of us. Before we get to that, though, I believe yeah. We have an honorable 17th place that I played it unplugged, PAX Unplugged, and mm-hmm. wrote up a little bit about it. You got to experience it. Yeah. And it was just recently reviewed by Shut Up and Sit Down, where Quinn said it is now his favorite game of all time. Oh, Quinn's. We're talking about Blood in the oh, Clock Quinn's. Tower. Blood on the Clock Tower. It is on the exterior yeah. of the Clock Tower. Yeah. So I, I heard all the things that you said about this game, and I'm here to say that they're true. This, wow. This game is, is... Wait, what happened? You're, you're supposed to be the one who disagrees with me. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I we can find we find lots of disagreement about... Mage Knight. About... <laughs> whatever. Mage uh, Knight is an amazing game, I'll have you know. It's two marks against one, Matt. You've been outvoted. You, you only get one collective mark vote, though. Dang it. <laughs> so, yeah, Blood on the Clock Tower is werewolf. Very... So, it's, it's better than werewolf, is my opinion. Oh, I'll agree with that. But they they really try to sell it as not werewolf. It's werewolf. I mean, I think the I think the the one real innovation is that for people who don't know this game, you kind of sit in a circle. You all have different roles, and then there's a narrator who puts you to sleep at night, and then a bad guy wakes up and kills somebody, and then you all wake up, you talk about it, and then you vote on killing someone. That so you know the good guys want to to kill the the demon in this case. Uh, and the bad guys just want to eliminate everyone. I forget the variant we played in in college. It was and we called it Mafia. It's Mafia. like a, it's basically a public domain game. Yeah, from yeah. who knows when. Um, so yeah, the the innovation of of Blood on the Clock Tower is that players who die can still fully participate. They have one more vote that they can use at any time, but they can fully participate in conversation. That's fine. That's great. But to me, I I. W- when I got killed off in this game, it felt just as bad as it does in Werewolf. Yeah, you just get it, to sit there and it, listen. It's well, the same feeling. It, in it's, some it's situations, a... it's almost worse because you have to sit there and continue. Yeah. Anyway, I will say that that, that innovation, I think, is an improvement, but it's it's it doesn't really change the game. So the, the other thing that I will say that this game has over Mafia werewolf i think that it leans into the narrator telling a story more it actually gives the narrator some tools to make choices that they think will make a more enjoyable experience there are some rules that have things like might like the town drunk i think it was the town drunk will be given a piece of information that might be wrong something like that the narrator actually has has the agency to do whatever they want with that but still like if, if you want a narrator to tell a real story play an rpg yeah i mean that's that's my advice so so this is the best game that i've played in that that genre but it's a bad genre because it's it's if you want the narrative thing go play an rpg if you want the intrigue play resistance yeah i mean 
I agree it's better than Werewolf. Werewolf is just not a good game. This is... Yeah. It's a marginal improvement. This is probably a mediocre game. So I don't know... A... I think unless you get really crazy into it and invest into like regular meetups, I can see how you could get a new layer because... Yeah. It does... The other thing they, they, they tout is that every person has a role. There are no like neutral villagers. Which might be cool, but requires a crazy, yeah. not what, a crazy yeah, investment. So what, what like, actually happened in my game was right off the bat, everyone just said what they were and, and gave out all the information. And I forget if anyone was lying or not. Everyone decided that I was lying and so they killed me. <laughs> but you, you would really have to play the game a lot to get to the point where I think that that information is very meaningful. Because there's just so much of it and it's all unique. Everyone has a unique role. Yeah, I agree. I think you would have to dedicate a lot of time with the same group for this to be a good or a better game. Right, because in giving everyone a role, it does create a very complex web of possible interactions, but it also creates a complex web of uninteresting interactions that you have to figure out are uninteresting. Right. Which is annoying. Well said. Like yeah. literally on the demos, they hand you a full sheet of paper of all the possible roles for the beginner game, right? The demo beginner game. And you're sitting there trying to realize the implications of it. And, you know, I'm just sitting there staring at this menu when I played and I realized after a while, there weren't that many interesting interactions. It's like, okay, this person could be this or one of these three things, if whether or not, depending on whether or not they have an incentive to lie or not. My role was literally, if someone did some kind of investigation on me, it may show up that I'm a bad guy and I'm not. So there's no question of how to play that role. You just say, hey, I'm this role. So, yeah. you know, you may get information that I'm a bad guy, but I'm not. Try to believe me. But, yeah. like... There's nothing more to do with that. Like maybe if someone does try to say at that point that I am a bad guy, you might be a little more suspicious of them, but it's a whole lot of toss-ups. It feels very bloated to me and seems to require a lot of time investment to get to the point where it's yeah as rich as people are, are maybe saying it is. And I just don't see how that's wor worth it yeah, and again, for a we, game we with love... almost... Like, I don't think the they've completely fixed the player elimination thing. I think it's kind of boring Absolutely to be not. a ghost. Absolutely I was not. killed off fairly early. It was really boring. Yeah. I couldn't do anything. I just had to, like, king make at the end because that's what the ghosts do, right? Yeah. Your vote becomes more powerful as the game progresses. So you just try to vote how you think in the key deciding vote. I don't understand. I, I honestly don't understand. I think maybe it could be interesting if you got super invested in it. But I don't understand how... A, it's worth that investment to like of like also boring very, very, dull games to get to that point. It's also very expensive. Or B, I don't understand how it's that great once you get there. I don't see what you get over over the resistance or two rooms and a boom, which are probably just better. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, the resistance is certainly better because it's doing what it's doing what this game's trying to do without all of the bloat. Yeah, it's so elegant and refined, and uh, I don't. I, I should be more, more, even the cat is agonizing over this. I should be less upset and more graceful, but I don't get it. I don't get it at all. All right, let's talk about good games. Well, a mediocre game first. Number 16 of the games that we played at PAX is Ceylon, a game about harvest, planting and harvesting tea in India. Uh, yeah, India, I think. Is it India or like Bangladesh? Oh, no, no, it was Sri Lanka. Yeah, I read the, the cover of the rule. It was, it was Sri Lanka. It doesn't matter. It's a game about moving around and picking up cubes. More or less, yeah. It was thoroughly fine. It was pretty mediocre. I like the actions are based on cards. They have two actions printed, so you do one, and then your opponents get to do the other action, which is good because everyone is involved at all stages of the game, and it goes quickly, but otherwise it is a thoroughly bland game. Yeah, that part of the game was really neat because sometimes you had some semi-difficult choices. Although I didn't find there was, you know, maybe in, in a non-two-player game, it's it's more interesting in terms of like who do you block or who do you give a bad option to? 
because you can pretty clearly see which of the actions that you're presenting to the other players they would be able to utilize or not but the actual that part was neat the actual gears of converting things into points that you see in any euro game just needed it needed more to be interesting it was just go to a spot plant a tea plant a was a plantation they called it in the game and then you like harvest everything around you so you get a whole bunch of tea and you try to match up the colors of tea leaves with the cards on the demand track so it's just doing things that you see in a lot of games some very good games i'm thinking of like viticulture but it was just lacking so much i think in terms of like just interesting parts other than the rote turn cubes into points yeah i also found the turning cubes into points to be kind of frustrating too because the point cards have different colors associated with them and you want to collect different colors and if all the ones that are out there are of colors you already have well do you want to take one of those for the meager amount of points and maybe end the game sooner probably not but there's no way to change that so maybe with more players it's okay yeah i don't think it's a bad game i think it's just it does things every other Euro game does in a less exciting way. So that's Ceylon. If you're really into Sri Lankan tea, then maybe look at it, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Number 15 is Selenia. Selenia. An even lighter Euro game about turning cubes into things. Uh, Not cubes. Wooden, wooden wheats and logs. Okay, they had a shape to them other than a cube. Yeah. Uh, but the the twist with this one is that it is set in some kind of fantastical world in which sunlight is geographically placed and doesn't move. So... Yeah, so one side of the planet is an eternal day and the other an eternal night. Like that episode of Stargate that was kind of weird. I forget you're like the only person on Earth who knows about <laughs> Stargate. Yeah, there was an episode with a planet that had exactly that and there was some weird stuff. Check it out. Oh wait, there's a there's an Asimov book about that, I think. Yeah, it's a great sci-fi premise. So anyway, in this board game, you are traveling in an airship around this planet making deliveries because some things have to be done on the day side, some have to be done on the night side. And so as as the game progresses, you will move the airship forward and the end of the board will fall off and flip over and become the beginning of the board. That needs to be a thing in more games. I liked it. I loved it in Bunny Bunny Moose Moose. Yes. It was simple in Bunny Bunny Moose Moose. Well, it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah you're just progressing and yeah. there's not enough space. So we just like treadmill it. And yeah. I think that's cool. I think yeah. it gives a sense of scale a, a little bit more than you would on a static board yeah. or like going in a circle. This was definitely the most interesting thing like it that I've seen. Um, and, and you flip the board over as you go. So like... I mean, sometimes you're all day, sometimes you're all night. Um, so as you're going, you're revealing parts of the board that were not available to you before. And e- so, yeah, and each of these pieces of the board just has spots that you can interact with. Yeah, and and the night and day sides had different resources they were better at and different resources they wanted. And there's a bit of set collection and whether or not you turn in things for day points or night points. It was a thoroughly simple game, certainly family weight. But if you are looking for a family weight game that is about turning cubes into points, you know, that kind of Euro game, it's beautiful. It looks awesome. I love the art direction with it. Yeah. Uh, it's got that airship. It's got ho- it's got cards with holes in the middle of them, which I irrationally love. Yeah. No, the, the, whole, the whole design was clever. I don't know. Yeah. Good game. It's certainly one dedicated more towards families. You didn't play this one, right? Yeah. Oh, that's why you haven't said anything. It looked pretty. <laughs> <laughs> number 14 which is i think this low only because we have a whole bunch of games that were all good and yeah the next like 10 games were really hard they're more or less tied really but somehow this one this one floated was bad. to the bottom this one was bad i think <laughs> it is a decent game improved by One of the most amazing mechanisms I have (laughs) ever seen in a board game. That's a fair assessment, yeah. Like, what are we talking about? What are we talking about, Mark? We are talking about Troll Fjord, which is a game about being a troll and doing troll things. And I don't mean an internet troll. For example, beating rocks out of a out of a mountain. Yeah, with a giant hammer. With a giant hammer. Now, of course, in board games, things are abstracted and Usually they're abstracted to the form of like moving something from one place to another or 
playing a card. In this game, beating a mountain with a hammer is abstracted to beating a cube tower with a hammer. Literally. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah th- th- this is what you do. Now, this game was in the new look section of the PAX board game area. But it was on the weird games table version par- section. Oh, of... I, di- I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. Rand- so we know... That, so That was a weird section of games. So pro tip, if you go to PAX East... In the corner of the tabletop area, there's a first look section, which is designed to have games that you know are new or you know they're, about to come out or hard to you know only and released in Europe. And there are awesome people there who want to teach you and will teach you the game. Yeah, the, so they're set up on the table already. There are people there who will teach you. The guy who runs it is awesome. He's a really nice guy, and he loves obscure games. He imports games from Japan regularly and from. You know, most a lot of the time from Japan, but Europe and I probably spent, all over the world. I probably spent fifty percent of my PAX time in that area. Yeah. Anyways, due to like shipping issues, you know, the post office and all that, he wasn't necessarily able to get all of the like super hot new releases that he wanted to get. So he brought some of his collection from home, which happened to be some very obscure, funny, weird games, because that's what he collects. And Trollfjord was one of them. Yeah. So Although I, I do what, think what I wanted, I do think it was a 2018 release, though. Maybe, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I wanted to say was, a lot of people played this game over the course because it was just always sitting out, mm-hmm. and like, and that tower took a beating. Oh yeah, like, it was. It was marked, dented. It, it looked like it might only survive three or four more games. I mean, it already had a good amount of tape on it. Yeah, yeah. Not, not to say it was poorly constructed, but I mean, maybe it was your typical like particle board. Yeah. Small dice tower kind of thing. Maybe expect to get like 20 to 30 games out of this. Yeah, I don't know how much Rand had played it beforehand. He says it's one of his favorite games. That's ridiculous. I mean, to be fair, if you're getting 20 or 30 plays out of a game, you're doing pretty well. Yeah, I mean, you know, almost like 99% of games people own will never have 20 or 30 plays. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So, so this game, I didn't think, ignoring the ridiculousness of the, the, the troll tower... I didn't think there was much game here. Basically, you're moving around the outside of the board, which lets you place trolls in in regions. Regions surround towers. And then at the end of your turn, if you have enough trolls around the tower, you get to take a swing at the tower. And it's got a push your luck thing. No, Matt. You missed the language of the rules. You hit the tower again and again. Yes, again and again. <laughs> again and again. Yeah, and it, it, it's got a cool push your luck thing with that. But basically, you're trying to get a certain number of cubes. If you get that number of cubes, you take a point token, and then you go to the next tower. And, and so I that much just isn't intriguing to me at all. So basically, the, the entirety of the, the intrigue in this game is hitting the tower, which is pretty cool. I think the, 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 the mechanisms of the game were actually fairly clever because when you're placing your little troll meeples, you can only be part of a tower hitting session if you are on connected two connected areas to the little tower mountain area on the board. And it has a very cosmic encounter like but more funny ally system where you can combine your troll units and someone else's troll units but it's not your option it's their choice so you're like okay i'm gonna try to get i'm gonna hit the level one tower and if anyone else is in two different spots adjacent to that tower they can just be like yeah i'm joining you and you have nothing you can do about it and then there's a little bit of intrigue because there's certain in each of the spaces surrounding the tower there's a different point value and that's how many cubes you need to get out of the tower without revealing too many of a one particular color. And so you can have situations where you smack the tower a few times, get the coins for the lower point thing. And then you like, you just nope out of there and leave. And then your ally has to try to get to the next threshold, which could net them more points, but maybe you're already at a very risky spot. The single best rule of this game is that (laughs) if you ever hit the tower and no cubes come out, you are no longer the tower hitter. You have to pass it to your ally. (laughs) And then they resume control of that because you were too weak, which is, it's so funny. 
I think it's a really fun game. I liked it's it a funny. lot. It has a lot of funny things, but I, it feels gimmicky to me. Yeah. There, I, there were a few real strategic decisions. I know I had times where I was able to not join someone when they anticipated me joining them, Matt, uh, which resulted in them not being able to get the treasure. Yeah, you there, were, you, I, think, I think it was you were very kind to me. And then later on, you were very mean to me, I think is how it went. It went back and forth, (laughs) potentially trying to get just enough cubes for the first player to grab their treasure and the second player assisting not to be able to. But realistically, it's a game about hitting a tower with a hammer, and that's fun, but it's not much of a game beyond that. I think it is a game beyond that. I I think you guys are playing it down. So I had... I also rated it the highest of the three of us, so... Oh, okay. Well, there we go. I played some other games that I wanted to compare to this. Troll Ford, to me, felt like a bad game that had this one sort of dexterity element that made it a fun experience. So the, I, I, I went through the board game booths on Saturday, and I happened to see Mega City Oceana, I think is the name of the game. And so this is a, this is a game where you are constructing little cities on a cardboard hex or i guess buildings maybe you're constructing buildings it's like high rises right yeah out of these varied uh, wood and glass pieces i guess it's probably plastic i was gonna say actual glass that'd be impressive yeah that have these different uh, that have varied shapes some of them are tall and thin some of them are kind of blocky Uh, but basically the game goes you on your turn you can grab a contract for a building You can grab a random assortment of building pieces, or you can buy this this floating hex. And basically, the idea of the game is you're going to fulfill a contract by building the building it describes on a floating hex. And then the other thing you can do on your turn is if you have built a building described on one of your contracts and it's sitting on your hex, you can then float it into the center of the board by physically pushing it. And if you make it all the way, connecting to the city that exists in the middle of the table already, then you score points via a simple system. If Is this all on the same material? Like, yes. They, it, it yeah, gives there's a you, big mat. It's a comes, mat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it has little areas marked. Or like, and is that the base game or was that a deluxe version? Um, you know, I don't know. I think it's the base game. Yeah, because like part of that is that you want to kind of equitable surface right right you would have to, to have play that. on yeah i'm not sure i think it's going to release soon or or i'm not sure if it's on kickstarter but it's not out yet i think it's coming but anyway so so this game to me was a better use of dexterity in a game that's more than that the the actual game was was interesting to me it's a simple get contracts get materials and then build a thing to fulfill your contracts. But then the dexterity part of of pushing the building into the center, making it so it stands and is a little bit mobile was more interesting to me as far as a, you know a complete game. So I don't know. It was really fun. I might recommend this to families. I mean, it's a dex game that I play, but I mean, obviously it's pretty light. So I like that for my combo dex strategy game. I'm really interested now after playing Troll Fjord in the other two games that I'm aware of where you beat things. <laughs> One is a Talk Talk Woodman, which is more of a delicate tapping, I think, and it's like it's like a Jenga alternative that uh, as far as I'm aware, and you're trying to like hit it just enough to get like the exterior of this tree off without the interior pieces falling off, and that seems like a blast. The other one, I don't remember the name of the game, but it's some kind of team game where it comes with an inflatable club, like a plastic inflatable balloon kind of, or like a beach ball kind of material, but in the shape of a club. And you have to give your your teammate instructions to do something. I don't remember what it was, but you can only communicate in the form of grunts and hitting them with the club. <laughs> And that sounds like a blast. That sounds like a way to get your friends to hate you. And I believe the game is called Ugtect. Yeah, that's it. Ugtect. I remember we... hearing about that years ago, and then it's never been mentioned since. Yeah. We got to get our hands on that game. So I don't know. I, this was interesting to me. I haven't played many Dex games. I don't desire to, but I don't know the conversation of like what is a good addition to Dex into a, a strategy game 
that it's kind of interesting. Mega City Oceana was by Jordan Draper, who is doing the Tokyo series. Oh, which include, I did not know that. Yeah, which includes, he has a co-designer who I don't have in front of me. But it has Tokyo Metro, which is a really heavy train game that, that we tried it's last year. It's not that heavy. Well, okay, yeah. It, it's it was intimidating to me. And it's, then I actually played Tokyo Jukatsu, which is a very light game. Is that the one that comes with a bunch of games in the box? No. Okay. No, that's the third of the three gotcha. Tokyo series. It, it, Tokyo Jukatsu. Fourth. Okay. There's Highway, right? There's Tokyo, there's oh, Tokyo Metro. Okay, I missed Tokyo that Highway. And then the other two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so I enjoyed the Jukatsu, which has got some some dex element to it as well. Oh, interesting. Because um, I know Highway does also, which which has a cool table presence to it. Yeah, dexterity games. Are there any? Do we even own any dexterity? I mean, we, drop it. We had drop it, which, which was pretty fun. I don't think we really have any others. Yeah. I mean, if you count, like, speedy dice rolling games, we have Space Cadets Dice Duel. That's not really dexterity. Drop It It seems like a good game for, like, I don't know, 8 to 10. I would recommend Mega City Oceana for kind of, like... It's better than Drop It? Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't play it with, like, an 8-year-old, but, you know, if if, if you're looking for a family game for, like, you know, middle schoolers more, Mega City Oceana. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of Drop It, actually, I, I forgot about this. I went to see Us, Jordan Peele's new movie. Yeah. And as is my habit, whenever any kind of TV show or movie shows a game closet, I see what games are in it. Drop It was in it. <laughs> nice. Along with, you know, all the a lot of, you know, Boggle and Scrabble and Monopoly and all that, but I, I distinctly saw Drop It. Although I will say the the best game collection of any fictional TV or movie characters that I've seen are is the shelf in IT Crowd, where they have a number of Euro games and I think even some like war games in there. Yeah, they have a, they have a nice game shelf. On the note of spying on people's game collections, is it at all weird that when I walk by people's houses, I often notice if they have like a game shelf in their window? <laughs> uh, yes, <I> don't, but <laughs> I mean, I've been there. I don't. I don't get out that much. So I, I mean, I'm not trying to spy on them, but I notice it if it's there. Hey, game boxes are colorful. It's just psychology. Okay, number thirteen is a game that I was very interested in playing. It was definitely on one of my lists somewhere to play because I know I heard Jason Levine from the Dice Tower talking about it very highly, and that's mm. Majolica or Majolica. I think it's Majolica. Magulica. No, I, I highly doubt it's that. Which is a tile drafting game yeah tile drafting i would yeah, say yeah and what you're there's like a there's a four by four square in the middle of tiles and you have these kind of bins you're dropping them into to try to match different cards that have different you know sets of tiles of same or various colors a lot of the games that we played this weekend had that as a thing yeah um i was wondering if we were going to wait to later in the list to do a comparison, uh, talk about this. this oh, yeah. One. There's another game that was very similar that's higher on our list. Yeah, let's um, talk about it then. Let's jump to number 12, The Climbers, which is a three-dimensional puzzly game by Capstone, which is cl- definitely the publisher we played, whose games we played the most of this weekend. Yeah, they, they were. By a margin, yeah. They hit it out of the park. I mean, Capstone is doing some pretty incredible things with publishing at the moment in terms of just a lot of really high quality releases that are coming out. I, I knew know a couple of them. Point them out as we come to them. I think there are three of them, I think. Yeah, this is the first one, The Climbers. Like I said, a three-dimensional mm-hmm. puzzly game where you're given these blocks of either like a perfect cube, a double cube, if you will, and then a half cube. And they'll have different colors on each side. And what you're trying to do is climb up the cube or the the mountain that it creates until you are at the you are the highest point possible when no one can move any higher. And you can you do that by picking up a block and rotating it or and or moving it and then trying to move your climber dude. You can only move up a half step except for when you use your two ladders, which lets you 
let you go up either a full step or two steps or one and a half steps if we're using that nomenclature for the distance. I thought it was all right. Yeah, it was fine. I think you guys liked this it is, much this, better than I did. This is on my fine shelf. I rated it where you did. Oh, really? Okay. Mark. Apparently, I liked it a lot, and I'm not even sure why I liked it a lot. <laughs> I mean, it looks very cool. It definitely has good table presence. There was a lot. Absolutely, of, yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what it is about it, but I did enjoy actually having to look at the pieces, move them around. It's very physical, but there's still a lot of opportunity to try to think of what your opponents will try to do, try to thwart them with a rule that we may have played incorrectly. Uh, we just played on hard, mo- hard mode, which apparently is a common mistake. <laughs> Yeah, someone else we talked to also played it that way and did not realize that that was yeah. a rules you, error. You have a token that can block an area, so no one can move onto it or move the piece under it or move a piece onto it. And we we played that you could do this every turn, but there's a chance that you should only do it once in the whole game. Yeah, the rulebook was kind of vague on it. Uh, but yeah, that was just, I don't know, it, it was fun to sort of plan ahead and try to thwart people. Yeah, I felt like, I don't know, I felt like the end game was interesting. Yeah. And it was kind of a, a puzzle to be solved. The middle and beginning game was just kind of... I don't know how far you can plan ahead, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't think you can plan ahead. I think you kind of just do your thing. Maybe in a two-player game, you could plan ahead more. I, I guess there's kind of a mismatch between the table presence and the puzzle presented, maybe. In that it looks more casual than it is? I'm not sure how many actual interesting decisions there are. Especially because... You're kind of railroaded to the top in a way. You might jump ahead by using your ladder, but now you don't have your ladder. And and the next person's going to, to use their ladder. You're, you're going to end up at roughly the same height towards the end. And then there's the end game. Right. Which and, is... and I don't know how interesting those decisions are. It's very cool how the decisions are presented in this three-dimensional mountain. But yeah, I don't know. It's fine. I mean, it's just definitely enjoyable. It's it's certainly an enjoyable game, and, and the visuals yeah. are a significant aspect of that. It yeah, does look yeah. very neat. I, mean, I wonder if the game would be more interesting if... It might be more interesting, but it'd be very hard to do a setup that would make it fair if not all the blocks had every color on them. Because part of the thing, I don't know if we mentioned it, is that you can only stand atop your own player piece's color or the neutral color. And I think all the blocks had every color on them. Yeah, so the only variation is for the half-high blocks or the two-high blocks, it's not a perfect cube. So the colors on the end kind of function differently. Yeah, that certainly matters, yeah. Function differently than than the the colors around the, the prism. But again, I don't know how interesting that actually is. Yeah, and, and there's something to be said about, you could call it the toy factor or the aesthetic factor, that it's... It's just more fun because of the way it looks and feels to play. Looking back, it doesn't feel to me that strategic or interesting or, like you said, with with a lot of compelling decisions. But I certainly enjoyed playing it. And I think Mm -hmm. you can't discount the enjoyment that you gain from the visual or tactile presence of something. We certainly got a lot of looks from people passing by. Yeah. Next on the list, number 11 is a recent... Spiel nominee from the great Dr. Rainer Knizia, and that's the... I, I didn't write out the full name of the game. It is The Race to El Dorado? Uh, the Quest for El Dorado, I think. The Quest. I don't know. You're trying to get to El Dorado, and it is a deck-building game, the simplest one, I think, by far that I've ever seen, and one that seems to intentionally be a and I hate this term, but it applies here, a gateway to deck building games. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think And so. I think the game is much more fascinating from that standpoint than it necessarily was from a gameplay standpoint because it was, I don't it was know. simple. I, I don't know if I totally agree there. I mean, it's also a short game. Sure. I mean, it's a light game. For a game of that, of its length, I would certainly play it. Oh, yeah. A lot more. I mean, like we said before, we're at the point where these are all games we enjoyed. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the coolest thing I think about this game is that you're building a deck, which are, I don't know, basically different kind of adventurers. Um, a captain or... I forget the guy who goes to the jungle. The guy with the machete. That's the mach- how I thought of him. Yeah, yeah. Um, or the one who just has money. 
Yeah, I don't know, which is used for going through the desert. A literal treasure chest. That's all you need. You just pay the desert to let you through. Yeah, yeah. Money yeah, helps so. desert survival. That's what we. That's the moral of the of the game. Leave your water bottles at home. Just go to the <laughs> anyway. Kiosk. You're building your your deck of of these cards that match the three land types on this cool hexagon built board, uh, and then on your turn you just play a card. And then you can move over whatever symbol your card has. And and there's just interesting terrain. So there's a little bit of puzzle of like plotting a path and then building a deck that is efficient to go through that path. It's got deck building things like cleaning out your deck. If you want to spend a couple turns uh, trashing, mm-hmm. you know, you could either trash or not. Maybe you just want to vault ahead and go with a crappy deck, but get way ahead at the beginning. But then yeah. at the end, when things get thicker and you need more of the symbols to pass through, then you're really going to be punished. Yeah. Although I think there's valid strategy both ways of like Definitely. slowing down at the beginning to try to craft a really fine deck, which is what you did, Matt. Right. And I tried to do a really heavy rush strategy where I more often than not use my cards to rush ahead, didn't buy as many cards to help me get money to purchase better cards. I tended to use cards that trash themselves. So the, there was an interesting thing, and this is part of, I think, what makes the game really, from a, from a high academic view, such an interesting design, is that a lot of the cards had like a normal, like ramped up, you know, higher costs but higher effect aspect to them and a kind of paired card that was cheaper but had a better effect but trashed itself after one use and i think they were relatively balanced although i think they might have been slightly balanced in favor of the self-trashing ones just to maybe teach people that in a deck builder you and in many games you often have fewer turns remaining than you think yeah and i think it well what do you think about this we played the introduction map Mm -hmm. there are a lot of components left in the box to oh and a lot more difficult terrain to make make difficult more difficult maps i think it could be really interesting i think maybe in a more difficult map using those self-trashing ones might not give you the longevity right to be effective yeah yeah. it changes your valuation we only played this once i see a lot of potential for interesting alternative setups i mean it's a modular board with more pieces and they're all double-sided you can play something yeah yeah this may be a game that actually would move up in my estimation after playing some of the more difficult terrains and variants of it yeah the big thing yeah the big thing for me is it's my favorite game that has deck building as a you know a, a primary mechanism that that incorporates a map i wait we we had this discussion you forgot about concordia and time of crisis oh um concordia yeah, it has a non-Mediterranean map. <laughs> Time of Crisis. We were debating whether that's really deck building. It kind of is. It's definitely okay. a deck builder. I think El Dorado feels like primarily a deck builder in a way that Concordia, Time of Crisis, don't give me that feeling. It, they don't give me the Dominion feeling of building a deck. Okay? Sure, they have more alongside of it. Yeah, uh, Concordia in particular is is excellent. The way it does deck building is different, but is is gives me the full deck building feel. I'll, I'll give you Concordia, okay, which is just an, an amazing game. So I will always give you Concordia. Yeah, but like for, for example, Clank. I love the idea of Clank, but it did not pay for me because I just didn't get to use my deck enough. I didn't have enough agency in building my deck. Oh yeah, we should really point care. out that this is a better Clank. Oh yeah, it's it certainly plays better faster, than Clank. Has more modularity. Well, and it doesn't have the random piles. It doesn't right. have the random selection of cards to take. It's I've gone on this rant before, but it still blows my mind that after Dominion, so many deck builders you see take away the static selection of cards in favor of a random selection. I don't understand why they did that. And um, an interesting thing about El Dorado is the number of cards is so limited that once once a particular card gets bought in uh, the way that it works, that the first person who buys it then makes that pile more immediately available. Sure, yeah. There's a real crunch. Like, if you want that card that someone else bought it, you really need to buy it now or you might not get any of it. Yeah, there's only three copies of each card type. Um, you know, so, so that's an interesting dynamic that a randomized deck or a, a randomized market like Clank just don't have 
interesting, things like that. Mm -hmm. Number 10 was on that weird table with Trollfjord, and... Rand was very excited for us to play it. Yeah, yeah, Rand loved it, and I can totally see why, because it is such a clever novel idea, executed in a way that I didn't... It's one of the games where I'm like, man, I should have thought of that. Like, it's right there. We have games similar to it, and that it just added a twist and made it more complex and did great things with it. That is the game Pass Tally, which I believe is not being sold in the U.S. at the moment. I believe it's Japanese. Yes, Japanese, and someone just acquired the rights to it. Yes, I forgot who Ren said acquired the rights to it, but it will be published in the United States. It is, if you've played the game Suro, or one of its variants, Suro of the Seas, or whatever the other newer one is, it is that game, but in a way that will melt your brain. Yes. It's about placing tiles, like Suro, placing tiles on a board to like change the path of of the board from an edge to another edge. Yeah. The, the Except game... that you can stack the tiles in past tally and you want to stack the tiles and it's it's wild. Yeah, the more tiles that the line connecting the two edges of the board goes through, the more points it's worth. So you want to connect through multiple tiles, but if they're stacked up, you count all the tiles in that stack also. This game is just a lot of cleverness in, in such a tight package. The, uh, the other thing that I liked about it is um, you have four markers around the outside of the board that mark the paths that are yours. But during the game, you can place these tiles that change the paths in the board, or you can actually move your markers around the outside. So there's just a lot of room for really clever plays that are you know varied and interesting. I found moving the markers wasn't happening past the first half of the game or so. People sort of got in spots that were scoring for them and didn't want to move from those spots. But with higher level play, I imagine you could probably redirect these paths in all sorts of ways and score huge amounts of points. Yeah, we were not as mean to each other as I think we should as have we should been. have been. Uh, like, for instance, I had a great high scoring path that stayed on the board for three rounds. Um, yeah. It, it, and... There are interesting things that you can do to protect your routes. Right, because of the verticality, the way you the stacking rules work, you can't like overhang at all, so you have to always place on a flat surface. And you can't place directly on top of another tile in the same formation, if that makes sense. So it has to lay across two tiles in some way when yeah. you stack on top. So we ended up with this kind of mountain in the middle of the board that was almost kind of self-protected. Uh, until people built up around the outside. But still, I don't know. I... But there was that hole in one point, right? Because we built around, yeah. and the tiles are like, if you think of the board in a in a grid, they're two spaces each. Yeah, two and by so you one. Could, if you, yeah, two by one. So if you create a kind of gap, a one by one gap, you literally can never build on that spot again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, to your point, I, I think in higher level play, I think people would be meaner to each other, messing up other people's routes. I'll never be nice to you again. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> You're dead to me. That escalated quickly. <laughs> yes, Although, but frankly, it's, it's one of those it's you, one of those you, games you, where the, you can have feelings like that. I think. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this is one that's incredibly simple, but there's a lot of brain burning going on. It's probably worth checking out if you can. Yeah, I think the the ratio of simplicity to depth of at least trying to comprehend your possibilities like visually is higher than any. Well. Higher than anything I've played recently, except for one game that we will get to later in this podcast. <laughs> this game wins most elegant that we played. I most believe. elegant. Maybe. maybe. I'm going to give it a tie with our number three game. Anyway, past tally. Definitely look for it. Yes. Number nine is the hot roll and write game. I still haven't gotten really heavy into the roll and write train which i assume is on the decline now like it's been the board game thing for a couple years now they gotta be running out of ideas for roland rights but this is the one that i always heard is the best and so i wanted to try it and that is welcome to uh with an ellipses at the end so no one can ever be sure if you finish saying the name of the game and it's about developing a neighborhood like a, a housing neighborhood and I enjoyed it quite a bit. I thought it was really cool. We had like 
literally 20 minutes to play it before we had to return the game at the end of the night so we kind of rushed through it a bit we also only had one pen so that was fun yeah that was fun that was oh yeah it, it gets knocked down a bit because it does not include any writing instruments how hard is it to put a couple of golf pencils in there come on come on like i know yeah if you're playing at home there's going to be pens and pencils around but at a convention or if you like buy it at a game store and wanted to play there or like you're trying to bring it to a place you don't want to remember to pack pencils or pens in it that just seems lazy i'm sorry i'm tired <laughs> extra grouchy anyways welcome to is one of the more complex roll and writes that i've seen uh you there are... call it roll and write it's card based yeah. but it's it's a randomizer and write which sounds awful so we say roll and write and the way it works is that you'll get three pairs of a number and some one of the abilities in the game, and you'll want to choose a house to write that the number on. Uh, they have to be, each street in your neighborhood has to have numbers in ascending order. And the ability will do something like build a pool in one of the houses that can a pool can be built in, which will give you points. Or uh, plant a tree, which will also give you points in various exponential yeah. curves then like place a um a, a gate was it a gate fence fence yeah fence and and when you place a fence it defines the beginning or end of an estate correct yeah which are like a scoring unit you can upgrade how much different sized estates are worth like each one is worth at the end of the game there are also cards worth which is know, a random goal action i think the yeah, real yeah, estate yeah. action lets you increase a particular size estate's score. Yeah, and there are various goals which are typically around having this collection of different estates on a single road. So it's a lot of things, exponential number curves and trying to like geographically place things correctly that you'd see in a lot of role and rights, right? You know, Castles of Burgundy, the dice game has that. These are much more thematic than something like Ganshan Clever, which is purely abstract. But what really, I think, puts it ahead and in, into a game that's genuinely interesting is the way it allows the players to manipulate the trigger of the end game. And whether or not you kind of want to rush that out and catch people off guard, or if you want to just out-efficiency them in a, a slower-paced game. Because one of the actions is called the BIN action, B-I-N, which I have no idea what that stands for. Biz? It must... Oh, biz. It's the biz action. Yeah, biz. I don't know why I thought BIN. I don't know either. I don't know what biz stands for either. Business? You think it's a business? Yeah, yeah. So... Oh, because let, let it me connects. Explain what this oh, does. You just blew my mind. <laughs> yes. Well, see, I was all about the business. Yeah, I didn't bother you with it. The business action allows you to, after you write your number on a house, you can then write on another house the business address for the house just to its left. Um, it, my it, mind is it, blown. Yeah. Here. So that's a thing, right? A business address. Yeah. So like, I'm at Four Elm Street, and I run my real estate out of Four Business Elm Street. Sure. I guess that's a thing. I don't know. It's probably also like Four A and Four B. I don't know. You, but you partition the, it. Yeah. Relevant to the game here, you just filled in two houses on the same turn. Yes, which accelerates the the end game. And that's the strategy I chose, which... But it deducts points. It deducts points. You lose points from it, but you accelerate the end game. And because you're writing the same number, it helps you meet that ascending number rule. It just allows you to put more houses down, which means you might score more estates. That too, um, yeah. That was my goal. It worked okay for me, but not as good as whatever you did, Mark. You got destroyed. That's I wouldn't very call it true. destroyed. I it would, was close. I would call it... It was not close. I got, I got destroyed. Beat. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what I was going for. It was a bit opportunistic, but I was going for the goal cards and uh, by creating certain sized estates and then uh, boosting the value of those estates as best as possible. This one really clicked for me in a way that I enjoy where the three card sets would be flipped out and I would see immediately exactly the one I'd want. I'd write it down and be like, done waiting for everyone else to make the decision i just love it when i instantly see what i want to do and don't yeah. have to think about it it's interesting because i think you're you're able to do kind of some high level strategizing and then there is enough of a puzzle each time the cards are flipped mm -hmm. 
that I got to figure it out. But I think you're right. It's not. It's not like a brain burden puzzle. No, it's no, not. But a, it doesn't have to be, right? Because it, no, it doesn't. Because the, it the presents, act of just like writing on a sheet and filling up things yeah. is just fun. It presents interesting strategy, interesting decisions, but it's not going to kill your brain. It's very pleasant. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's also a bit of strategy that I was focusing on a lot in the distribution of the numbers because they're in a bell curve ish distribution. Right, right. So if you see a very high or very low number. You often are at a crossroads of maybe it doesn't have the action that you wanted next to it, but you may not see that number again for the rest of the game. So you have to you know make make some interesting tough decisions there. So uh, it's not you know, my favorite roll and write, but it's probably my second favorite. This is my favorite roll and write, and I haven't played your favorite. Yeah, which is uh, let's make a bus route, which I will be talking about next podcast. I know I we, we had to schedule it because. The next podcast will be about a convention I went to like two weeks ago. Don't worry about it, people. It's all, it's, everything's under control. A little bit after we, we left the convention and whatnot, I found myself thinking back to this of without really caring about it very much, which is kind of interesting. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just not sold on the rule and right thing. I was um, thinking that I'd want to play it again with more time so I could pay attention to what my maybe, opponents are doing, maybe. doing because that really... I had a really good Hurt time me. playing it. I think when I look back on it, I, I couldn't remember what my interesting decisions were. So I'm not sure. It's worth playing again. It, it was definitely the most fun rule and write. But right now, I'm not high on that genre. Clearly, you're a Scrooge. It's rare that I'm the Scroogest. Well, moving on to a game that is really pleasant. Uh, we have Noctiluca. Noctiluca. That sounds right. It's named after some kind of tiny ocean creature that is bioluminescent, and it has those dice that, like, Sagrada uses that look awesome that more games need to use because they look so cool. Colorful, transparent dice. Yes. Oh, yeah. Little, so many little colored transparent dice. Like, this, literally... This game looked awesome. It looks great. And it is very reminiscent of Majolica. Yeah. The game we didn't talk very much about before. They're contract, collect, and fulfill games. Yeah, with with drafting. Yeah, with drafting. Like spatial with puzzle drafting. drafting. A, yeah, out of a center puzzle of sorts. Yeah. Uh, Noctiluca is certainly the lighter of the two. It's it's definitely a family level game. The center board is a big hexagon, which has two spaces outside of the hexagon where you can place one of your pieces, and then on each edge. On each edge. Yeah. Yes. And then from there, you draw a straight line through either three or four of the subdivided hexagons in the middle. Yes. And from that line, you can claim dice. Yes. So you declare, you look at all the dice in there, and there are four or five at the beginning of the game, four or five in each space. And you state a number, and you collect all the dice of that number. But what you care about for the contract fulfillment are the colors of the dice. So... It's again, it's it's a fun puzzle, but light puzzle to try to figure out how you can collect the most relevant colored dice to fulfill the contracts you have and yeah. kind of race it out. And I think for this one, you always have two contracts. And then when you collect the dice, you just put them right on the contract until you've completely filled it. It's just a matter of like selecting what's best for you and potentially some kind of blocking maneuver you know, to, to stop someone from getting a, a bunch that, that they want. There was some end-of-game stuff. It was just the color... Yeah, there were three there were suits s- of contracts. Yeah. And then the, the person who collected the most in a s- suit got some bonus. That was interesting. Yeah, little stuff like that, real yeah. simple. There was also a bonus for collecting dice uh, of a particular color that was randomly given to each player. And hidden, yeah. So little stuff like that you'd seen before, but I think... The drafting element I enjoyed so much. A, a family weight game, very much so. But the visual aspect of it and yeah, the, so the pure guys... enjoyment of just drafting and trying to find your your best option there was, was very fun. Also, I... the decision of what contracts to take because you're fighting, you're, you're doing a kind of tug of war over trying to get the most fulfilled contracts of different colors. And then compared to the dice that you potentially might be able to get in a future turn, there's some, there's a little bit of thinkiness in there. Yeah, I th- so I think you guys both like this better than Majulica. 
Majolica is the lowest on my list, so... Oh, really? Okay. I like Majolica more. So just in comparison, because it is very sim- similar, in Majolica, you are collecting tiles from the center board. Uh, and the tiles are arranged in a 4x4 four four grid, four of four different kinds of tiles randomly distributed. When you collect them, they go onto your your player board, which has four areas, and you have to put them in certain combinations of of colors like the first one has to have three of one color and three of another you can't just put whatever you want there when one of your areas is full that area then runs it's like you have a machine and now it runs because the area is full and that sends some of those tiles up to the contract in that area and then some of the tiles move on to the next area so there's there's one more step kind of in the puzzle of your you have this efficiency engine on your board, which I found really interesting. Yeah, I just didn't find the machine like thinking ahead that interesting. When I compare the two games, Noctiluca just feels much more elegant, whereas Majolica seemed to, in comparison, add gamey bits just yeah. for added complexity that I don't think were warranted. I always had a pleasant turn in Noctiluca. Everything I did felt nice and pleasant to do. In Majolica, it was a lot of trying to plan ahead and then getting presented with sub, you know, with with drafting options that you couldn't yeah. quite fulfill. Yeah. yeah so the my response to that was I, would be I one I really enjoyed the added puzzle of getting your machine to run efficiently it's more of an efficiency puzzle because you have that added step whereas noctiluca kind of felt more like you're mostly racing to get the most dice sure as soon as you can i, I can't argue yeah. with that oh Majolica yeah, yeah. is certainly a more strategic game you have to plan ahead yeah. a lot more no, no no no, no it's, no, it's that's a game fine. where you just sit down and kind of do nice things and then the, yeah you know, collect stuff to compare the center boards both of these games were, were really good I'd, I'd recommend them both oh um, sure yeah um the center board of majulica i found interesting because it was so limited and so i cared more about what other people wanted than i did in noctiluca mm-hmm. and then finally one more comment this affects me more than it affects you guys. I had terrible AP in Noctiluca staring at all the dice because it always felt like I was missing some better play because there are just so many dice and you're looking at the numbers. So I don't know. That is what it is. It, I, found, I found that that looking at tons of dice, trying to pick out lines of numbers, a little more frustrating. Oh, sure. You know, so th- then, then more of a puzzle of Majulica. I was thinking about it just now. I largely agree with Mark's comments on Majolica, but I feel like my issue with it might have been that it felt like too much work to get anything done rather than collecting tiles, which was kind of a chore in itself, to fill out your machine. And then only a few of those tiles go up to fulfill the contract, so you have to fill the machine again and again to actually complete the contract. It felt like you had to do too much to score a handful of points. Yeah, and it and just I, felt slow. I think, I think you the game ends when someone collects five contracts in Majolica, whereas not the Lutka. It just goes until uh, yeah. everyone's done it's two rounds. Two rounds. Yeah, two yeah. rounds and everyone gets four actions yeah. each round. So not the Lutka is shorter, but you're collecting about the same number or more contracts. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, it, I think you you're spot on where it just it feels like more work to get something done in Majolica. It's probably yeah. also because I played poorly. Like most of the games. I, I did pretty well in a lot of the games. But we won't talk about those ones. <laughs> yeah, just wait. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting comparison. Again, two games that are extremely similar. And I, yeah. you know, nine times out of ten, I, you know, in that situation, I go with the more strategic one. But, you know, I would certainly give it another play. I think it's a good game. It just wasn't particularly exciting to me. I think Mark's comment uh, is, is the way I felt as well. It's a lot of work. You didn't get the sense of accomplishment. Whereas Noctiluca really hit a nice spot for me of a family weight, casual game. Everything you do is enjoyable. It looks really nice. Uh, you get to accomplish things. There's there's enough strategy that it didn't feel rote. Plus the theme is very unusual. Yeah, I learned about some kind of new critter in the ocean. Yeah. They glow. I literally have no, no idea what else they do. Moving on to number seven is the game that I disliked more than you guys by a fair margin and 
it is one of our most, I, I calculated the standard deviation on our ranks, and this is the one of the more decisive ones after Majolica, actually. And, and the Climbers. And the Climbers. And this is Symphony Number no. 9, a game from China about, what, 18th century classical musicians? 19th century? Yeah, 18th century. I 18th century, yeah. yeah. You just don't like any music without a heavy beat you don't like anything without a sitar apparently none of this is true i love beethoven <laughs> so the game is basically about getting compositions out of classical musicians until they drop dead yes yes exactly <laughs> that's that's it, that's it really i i yeah. enjoyed it just not again all these games are kind of grouped together in a in a good not great category in my mind in this one there's like a drafting phase and then an auction phase but it's a collective auction what you're doing is there's this kind of timeline for all the musicians and they have various cubes in different spots on the timeline and you're drafting those cubes to try to be the best patron for those different composers. Because that gives you uh, end game points. Yeah, it gives yeah. you some way to get points. So each at the end of each season, the person who has the most patronage with a particular composer gets a work from that composer. Right, which will help them score points. And then there's the concert, and you're all kind of together funding the concert with a simultaneous blind bid of money. And it has a really neat mechanism that it, that I don't know if we exploited as much as much as we should have, where you want the total of all of the bids in the game to fall within a certain range. And if it's far too low or far too high, the concert fails, either because you just didn't give enough money to fund it, or the reason in the rulebook for it failing for going too high is that all the peasants revolt at the extravagant display of wealth. <laughs> and so within that concert range, you have three different levels of prestige, which determines which composer gets to give a concert, which affects who gets paid. If you have some cubes of the composer whose concert happens, you get some amount of money because you're a patron of them, and then you get to use that money to bid for things. But what you're really trying to get for the end game is the cubes, the patronage compositions of these composers to get various kinds of points. It was an interesting game. There are an aggressive number of like rubber banding mechanisms. For instance, if you get the composition of a particular composer you have to discard some of the cubes that you own of that composer so you're less so you can't kind of like hold on to a lot of one particular composer and just write him all the way through and whenever you collect income from owning the cubes of a particular composer you lose those cubes or you lose one of that composer's cubes you but also if you're the most if you give the most to the concert so you you bid the most in that in that simultaneous auction, you get some kind of reward for it. So there's a lot of things that are constantly pushing the game in terms of the resources you have back into balance, which I felt a bit it felt a bit too aggressive to me. Yeah, it was aggressive. I guess this game was the the biggest outlier of any of the games we've played and games that I've played recently. But at the core, I think it's really just sort of this efficiency puzzle where you're trying to get the most out of your resources, your your money, without other people noticing it. Because there's some like secretive bidding. Right. Well, it's incredibly interactive in that everyone's, whether they want to or not, always in the way of everyone else. Yeah. And you're all basically going to end up with about the same number of cubes and money. And so it's about just kind of sneaking in tiny little advantages yeah it's about like, knowing knowing when to pay the eight money for that fourth cube right which seems like a lot but if you if you seize an opportunity to w win patronage one round that could have a huge impact sure and, and and you might rubber band and not actually lose that eight money in the end i'm not entirely sure what it is i like about this game it i mean i appreciate that it is colorful and has a unique the, theme the theme and components through. were absolutely lovely um, it definitely gets some some points for that yeah I, I think i agree a lot on timing being important ba balancing your resources i i enjoyed a lot of 
sort of trying to predict what your opponents were going to do, what composers you thought they were going to go for. Can you right. sort of beat them to the punch at the last minute or should you hold back and wait to do that in a future round? Should you kill the composer before they can claim the cubes and take that co- last composition away from you? I'm yeah. sorry, Mark. Yeah, I, um, I made a large mistake in that game. And of course, uh, blind bidding is something that is often not good in games and something I don't enjoy. I actually enjoyed it here, trying to figure out what range people were going for and try to play accordingly. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if the game would improve on future plays, if there's much room for better play, or if it's a sort of one and done kind of thing. It's like I've experienced yeah, it, it know, was fun. But... Honestly, this game probably has the widest uncertainty margin for me. I feel like this game could be really great if you're playing with people who really know you know, how the scoring interacts, can really see what the others at the table are doing. Uh, I ha- I think it has potential to be great. It also has potential to be pretty one and done, I think. Yeah. I, I don't know I yet. I think that's really astute, actually, uh, as an observation. I think it's really walking a tightrope in terms of just having enough to where, you know, everything's played on this really tight margin. So it could be really interesting and similar to a game that we have coming up in that it's all about really precise moments of timing and opportunity or it could like or it could just kind of play the same way over and over again yes it, symphony number no. 9 was also very pleasant to play which is not something that i would normally say for a game that's walking a tight rope or or something with with the blind bidding where you have to out wit your opponents it was a fun mid-weight game yeah so yeah I, I really enjoyed it but i don't think i'd go out and play it again i'd play it if someone else wanted to play it i wouldn't i wouldn't want to buy it yeah i wouldn't yeah. go out of my way for it yeah but i mean that's i mean that's frankly the majority of the games we played yeah. it was like yeah that was fun i probably won't buy it but it was a fun game speaking of another one actually this one i'm really interested in because it could get a whole lot better i think we got to, we played like three quarters of a game of it mm-hmm. and that is san francisco 1906 a little ah. small box worker placement or action yeah kind of worker placement or action drafting yeah this, i guess those are kind of the same thing it was more or less a worker placement game so it was cool because it came in a small box so instead of having a board it was several cards laid out that had four worker spaces four players you would get to take one space per card as you go around that completes a year there's like six years and then the game ends mm-hmm. so one benefit of that being that it's in a small box of so someone who's got space limited or wants to carry it around with them there's a real serious yeah. medium weight worker placement game in a tiny box, which is quite nice. Yeah, absolutely most packed in per volume. Yeah. Okay. yeah. As far as, you know, theme mechanisms, it's pretty standard fare as far, uh, for a worker placement game. You know, you're collecting money, you're collecting permit cards that let you build in certain locations and ultimately trying to fulfill secret and public objectives to score the most points. Yeah. Uh, but it was all done very well. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of aspects that elevated above kind of a standard fair game. One of them would be the really aggressive distribution of scoring cards where you could get a lot of them throughout the game. Yes. Of like objective cards to score. And maybe it's a strategy to like get a whole bunch of objectives and do less on the board. So that was a big chunk of the game, which which was interesting. Yeah, that, I mean... The action for taking a scoring card was nearly as common as the action for build a thing on the board. Yeah, and then the other thing was these this kind of mini set collection game when you put a house... Because the, the, the theme is about rebuilding after the 1906 uh, earthquake in San Francisco, which was completely devastating. And when you place a house, you can place it with one permit, which just places the house, or with two permits, where you place the house and you get a card for one of these various little mini set collection games. And so the tempo trade-off on that was interesting. Yeah. Um, especially since also placing houses determines the end game. Because once you place all your houses, you deter- that is the last year that, that happens in the game. So like Welcome To, there's this kind of tempo accelerant option you can use. Or you can kind of play it a bit slower for more points in the end if the game ends up being moderately slow. 
uh, I just thought it was it was very enjoyable and had good elements of that kind of game. What do you think about this? So one of the things that I thought was really good, um, basically these six cards with the four action spaces, I assume that those can be distributed in any order? I believe so. They were distributed when I went, because in the first look section, all the games are kind of set up and ready to go. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't, I don't remember in the rule book what it said to do. I didn't notice any markings or like numbers on them to right. say there was a specific order. And I believe they were also double sided. So the progression of what kind of actions are available through each round could be completely randomized. I think. Yeah. And, I, and that seems great. Now, mm-hmm. w- one of the things that you could do, however, if if someone else took the space on a card that you wanted, you could go to the space next to them, pay two money and get to take the action adjacent to yours. I almost feel like that was too forgiving. I want, wonder if the game wouldn't have been better if the actions were more punishing. The, well, remember, the we placement. only played like three quarters of a game. So that kind of thing is usually much more valuable and, and much more of a needed balance thing in an end game. Yeah, I think in our three quarters of the game, I think right. we only used that twice, maybe. Yeah, or, or maybe, maybe just... Maybe, I think it would have been used more in that last quarter. Yeah, when you're desperately trying to fulfill your goals. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I kind of wish it was more punishing in that regard. Now, maybe money was more available in our game just because of the action, you know, the side of the action cards. Could be. Uh, and like you said, we didn't actually get to the end game. Uh, usually, usually, I'm not the one to, to say I wish this game was more punishing in our group. But I don't know. It kind of felt like you were going to just do a bunch of things and... I never got to the point where I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I, uh, I faced a lot of interesting trade-offs throughout the game, I think. Mm-hmm. Especially, well, I think I played it more loose and aggressive with my money. You guys were saving up your money a lot more. I was often spending all my money really quickly and trying to s- squeeze by that way. So maybe I had a different perception of, yeah, of yeah. the the meanness of the game. Yeah. But I thought but it was really nicely done. All in all, the, the way the action selection was, was was really impressive for this tiny little box game. But speaking of impressive action selection, our number five game is Coimbra, which it, or it might be Coimbra. Uh, it's it's a something along the lines of Coimbra. City. Yeah, and very colorful, nice art, medium weight Euro game with a an action drafting mechanism kind of like dominant species in that you're filling out this timeline of occurrences, drafting those spaces effectively, and then you resolve them. But you're doing that to get cards. So the main portion of the game is that you roll a whole bunch of dice, and then you have these little very lovely dice stands, or like dice yeah, stands, I guess, that you kind of slot the dice into. To, to indicate that you own them. So you go around drafting the dice to put in various spots. And how it works is that there are there are th- these, this token area, but that's less important. There are these three rows of cards. And the person who has the highest die face on that row at the end gets to choose which card they want first. But the value of the die is also how much they pay for that card. And that drafting mechanism is really interesting i think it's just yeah, it, fundamentally it solid and makes good. for very very good tough decisions i don't know that i've played a game where i didn't like the dice drafting dice drafting is just great it's like excellent, yeah. like pulsar is wonderful uh sagrada I, I don't think you've played that matt but that's really nice mm. role player is very fun that's got dice drafting in it that trade-off between the the, the price and and the the chance to go first is just so great and you can play it either way uh throughout the course of the game i did play it both ways well and also factors into like a budgeting thing because there are two resources that are more or less indistinguishable other than that they are two different things and the color of the dice that you choose indicate what kind of income you're going to be gaining in a later phase of the game. And that income is what you pay to get the cards. And of the four income spaces, there are the two purchasing resources or like the intermediary resources. There's one that's just straight up victory points. And there's another one that moves your little monk around on 
a, a, a map board, a geographical board, where he can go around and get bonuses of various resources and points and stuff, uh, which could turn out to be somewhat powerful. It effectively comes down to, if you want to s- choose very specific cards and go first a lot, your trade-off is that you have to choose dice colors that give you the money allowed to do that, which it in it of itself has the opportunity cost of not taking the dice that more directly give you victory points. And it's this kind of really neat interaction all yeah. throughout the phases of the game where it, and your decisions kind of trickle, the impacts of those decisions trickle throughout and then circle back on themselves. Yeah, and, and you're probably going to get close to a dozen cards throughout the course of the game, something like that. And yeah, because it was four rounds... You could get up to a dozen, right? Up to a dozen, maybe? Okay. Yeah, because there's also the tiles, so it depends okay. on how many times you get a tile. So ten. You'll probably get nine or ten. Sure. And many of them interact with either future cards that you buy or the dice that you draft themselves. Uh, so, you know, by the, by the end of the game, it's not like a game-changing engine, but you get a little bit of this interesting interactions with that that make the later dice drafting even more interesting yeah and i rank this higher than either of you and i think that's accurate that i enjoyed it a fair amount more than either of you i thought that it created very very interesting decisions and again so many different trade-offs and opportunity costs to navigate through just the actual just selecting of what die to pick who won this one uh i believe i won this one Oh, we weren't going to talk about you winning. But, okay. Uh, I think I also liked it the least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so the thing that took it down from me, and I originally rated this higher or ranked this higher, is it is just such a point salad that when I look back on my decisions, I wonder how much they actually mattered. Everything that you said rings true, Mark. But at the same time, sometimes I get lost in these point salad games. It's like there's just, you could do so many different things. Are the decisions I'm making as interesting as I feel they are? Yeah, to go off of that, uh, like was said, you can put a high number down and get to choose your card first or a low number and pay less but get stuck with what's left. And very often I was just putting a low number down because I didn't feel like making a decision. And I still won. I do have thoughts about this game. So the dice drafting part of it is excellent and everything else... We can all agree on that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we can all agree there. Everything else looks like someone looked at every other Euro game and was just like, oh... Euro games are supposed to have an influence track. Let's put some of those. Euro games are supposed to have shipping. Let's have some ships. Euro games are supposed to have a map that you move around on. Let's have a map that they just took generic Euro stuff and threw it together with a good dice drafting mechanism and called it a game. And I, every, I that's that's pretty fair. I think that is exactly what it felt like. <laughs> every part of it, it worked. It was fun enough i mean I, this is eight on my list of 15 it's not a bad game it's not a great game for me but it, it just felt generic there was no theme tying any of it together the art was very good a second thought i had it didn't feel like you got to do much there were four rounds you select three dice and you do stuff with the dice and despite that it felt long because there's everyone has, has to decide what color and number of die do i want where do I place that die? What card do I take? What do the symbols on all these cards mean? It was very slow for everyone's turn to not yeah. ultimately do all that much. Yeah, I guess you make exactly 12 decisions in the game. Now, kind of a lot happens with each one of those. And, and as the game progresses, more will happen each time you choose. There are a fair number of sub-decisions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are plenty of decisions. I mean, picking the die, where to place it, what card you take, and then yeah. if you get movement point, you know, yeah. which tracks you want to go on and where you want to move to. I really liked what you said about this feels really long for a game where you're just picking 12 dice. I, I completely disagree on that. Like, I understand, but I think the way that the simple decision of picking the dice kind of explodes out to a number of different consequences that you're trying to navigate through and not in a really an annoying like hard to figure out way but just like oh if i do this i'm not able to do this it kind of just everything kind of again trickles down from the one decision yeah and you can see the, all these different paths you can take i found that very very fun and i enjoy point salads quite a bit so yeah it, when it comes down probably to probably more than average so 
I think I was more inclined to like this game. Yeah, I think when it comes down to this, I agree with Mark more than I agree with Mark on it. I don't know. I think <laughs> I think Mark has some good points, but Mark also had you know there's yeah, validity no, to both I, claims. I think At the I, end of the day, Mark is right. <laughs> I am yeah, I'm definitely in between the marks on this. <laughs> oh my. No, I think Mark Davis. I I think that I agree more with you. I think as as the decisions kind of sub have sub decisions that are that are all interesting. Yeah. And the dice drafting is just so much fun to begin with. I wish it was a little more streamlined, but I typically am not into point salads as much as you are. So Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was a bit point salad I, I I felt there could have been a bit more negative interaction, maybe. Like, for instance, on the map movement, everyone can claim every tile they move over. Maybe the first person gets a better reward than the second and third people who go there. I oh, that would be an excellent uh, as, improvement. I, I, but I will say, as negative I have, as, a, as I have been on this game, it is decent. It's probably worth checking out if you like dice drafting. Yeah, yeah. Don't let the mark scare you away. <laughs> All right, number four on our list is a card game that has been, I think, pretty universally critically acclaimed and got a newer uh, reprint with absolutely delightful, fantastic art from the always amazing Beth Sobel, and that's Arboretum, which uh, Mark and I demoed uh, at the... What publisher is that? Renegade? Renegade Games. Renegade booth. Games yep. uh, booth. I had never played it. I always wanted to play it because I always heard such great things about it, and it was very, very good. It is a mean little card game, though. Oh, man, is it mean. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting decisions for how simple it is. It's like, what card, what tree do I want to plant, and which order do I want to put them down in? But you also have to keep some of the trees that could score you points into your hand, because if you aren't holding the majority of that tree in your hand at the end of the game, then you don't score anything at all. And a lot of people I was demoing with made mistakes with that and ended up with really low scores. Yeah, it well, it, it's a game where you're planting these trees to form this arboretum and you're going to get points by drawing a path between similar types of trees. But as the person who demoed it for us warned us, all the scores are going to be very, very low. And it's got that really weird tension because you want to play trees to score points for them. But in order to do that, you have to also not play that tree and keep it in your hand. So in some ways it's like this collaborative push your luck game with like card counting that you need to do really to play the game well and a lot of different symbols to keep track of and a lot of like paying attention to what the other person does it reminds me almost of a really really beefy like three or four times more complex multiplayer lost cities because you're trying to with the other people at the table navigate this deck of cards and really keep track of what the deck of cards are. And it has the same thing as Lost Cities where all your discards are available to other players and you have to discard cards. Really thinky, robust game that kind of takes this idea of collecting sets and pushes it to an extreme. Yeah, the the timing with you have to discard a card, so what do you want to discard? Are you going to be helping anyone else is interesting. And I also feel like with higher level play you could probably play with the tempo of the game some by drawing from the discard piles as opposed to drawing from the deck because once the deck runs out the game ends and unfortunately i didn't get to plant my high value tree before that happened despite trying to slow the game down there yeah yeah simple but i feel like there's a good amount of depth to it and really fun i mean it's it's not a game i'd want to play all the time because it's just that much to keep track of but i think it's from a design standpoint remarkable in how intense it made a game that's literally just a modified deck of cards right it's just a bunch of suits with numbers one through eight in it yes the suits are trees and the suits are trees yeah really fascinatingly elegant design all right we're down to the top three we're all still awake oh boy barely and the the, these top three were all of our top threes We almost had exactly the same order, but I think it's pretty clear that these three games were the highlights in terms of these were definitely the three best games we played. Yeah. They were wonderful. By a large margin. Yeah, by a a decently large margin for me. 
So coming in at number three is a game that came out a couple years ago by a smaller publisher, but is getting republished by Capstone Games. This is number two of Capstone oh boy. Uh, that we played by Tom Russell, the guy who, with his wife Mary, runs Hollenspiel, uh, ah. of which I've talked about and reviewed a couple of their games. And this is called Irish Gage. And it oh, is... Gage, that's like a train word. Yes, it's a train game. I just figured out that. Uh, and it's of some particular subgenre of train games that are in... I wish I had known this years ago when I went to the board gaming hobby, when I always heard about, oh, there's the train gamers with all their very complicated train games that they're off in the corner playing, and uh, they're just crazy. This is a medium light game. Yeah, this was so easy to play. This is a medium light game. One page of rules front and back, very simple. Yeah, very simple. So I've been intimidated by, I call them company and stock games. Sure. Uh, whatever. A lot of these train games where you don't own the trains, you own shares. And right. someone else might buy shares in your company. And to be fair, the 18xx ones are complex. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always found them intimidating. I, this is kind of like the entry level game. That's also just amazing. Yeah. If you want to try out a train game, this is a great one to start on. Yeah. You start the game by auctioning off shares of the five different train companies that start in different parts of the map of ireland and so everyone's probably going to get a share of a company almost certainly and then on your turn you can extend track by placing some cubes down on the board uh, to make your trains hit more cities uh, which will make them more valuable you can put a larger cube on there which is special interest which makes potentially that city more lucrative uh, you can... But, but potentially pull, not. But potentially not. You can call for an auction of another share of a c company. Not even a company you have a controlling interest yeah, in or anything. Just, just like, any hey, company. Yeah, this company is going to be auctioned off now. Or you can call for dividends where you kind of do a valuation of every company. And it's done with a very simple cube pulling mechanism. There are three different colors and only the colors that are pulled in of the three cubes that are pulled will be scored so the cities with those colors on them will get some an amount of money the smaller towns will always get the same amount of smaller amount of money and the colors that weren't represented well they that was a bad business venture that year or whatever and they don't pay out yeah something interesting about that too is that the larger cubes the special interest you're placing out are also those cubes you're drawing from the bag so yeah if, if you yeah. put a color down in a city that color is less likely to be pulled that's uh such such an elegant move right there and those cubes are also the timer on the game yes um that's the whole game so where the where the strategy comes in is in timing it's really in timing and the person who taught us mentioned this like, this is a timing game and i completely see it's definitely a game about timing because the two actions laying track or doing a special interest are actually improving the value of your company so you kind of want to always do that and like calling for an auction doesn't mean that you're going to actually win that auction and calling for dividends is a zero tempo move but all of those things could be precisely the right thing to do at any given time by right. each player yeah. to gain an edge and the way to kind of evaluate the different train companies becomes more clear as the game goes on. It's it's really hard to do that at the beginning of your first game, but you kind of get a better sense, I think, once you understand the map and everything. And it's just about, okay, do I need to push and try to hit another city with my my company? Or if I do that, are other people going to make their companies even more valuable in the meantime before the next dividend call comes in? Or do I want to pull that cube and add it to a city knowing that it's less likely to be drawn and, and scored on later? Or looking at everyone else's money, if I call for an auction, can I choose a, a stock that I don't really want to try to drain people of money? Yeah. And if I do that, if I call an auction the next round for something that I do want, have I lost too much tempo on the companies that I own? It's a lot of really tight decision making like that, a lot of very marginal decision making with just the timing of what action to do when. Yeah, I think that pretty much encapsulates it all. I, I found that just the the actual actions were very straightforward and, and easy to understand. I didn't have to do any kind of head math 
to understand the kind of the direct implications of, of an action. Mm-hmm. So it just, it, it became a very, uh, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure of the language here, but each decision was just a super interesting, but s- straightforward kind of presentation of yeah. here are my options what is you know what is the best for this moment yeah which just then, felt very satisfying yeah and this is the one i alluded to earlier when talking about symp- uh, symphony number no. 9 where everything's really on a margin and everyone's going to kind of end up with this you know unless someone really screws up on an evaluation on an auction bid yeah everyone's going to kind of be on the same progress forward in terms in terms of how much money they have either in, in in liquid cash or in stock value, which pays out at the end. And so you're really fighting over those tiny marginal gains. It was a hit with me. I, I really, really enjoyed it. It looked great. I don't know if there's anything else to, to say about this one. Oh, I did find out that the map we were using was a prototype of the Eno tool art. And the final oh, thing will look even nicer because it's going to have nice little wooden trains instead of cubes. Yeah. Oh, really? So that I really was like not, the cubes. That was <laughs> not... Well, it's it has cubes still for the special interest, but not right. the track. Yeah, that's which is good, good because yeah. in at least in the version we had, I don't know if it was like that in the original printing, but you know, you, you don't always want to have just like larger and slightly smaller cubes be very distinct things. Yeah, no, you, you want trains for yeah. for a train game. All right, number two, barely squeezing in at number two because our number one was unanimous. Number two is PAX Premier 2nd Edition. I specify because the 2nd Edition is, uh, as far as I can understand, fairly different from the 1st Edition. Yeah, I played the 1st Edition last year at PAX at you know, late at night. I don't remember all that much about it. I know it was different. There were no victory points. It was all about certain cards that were like domination cards would come out and you had to set yourself up to win before taking one of those, which is sort of munchkinian that you're building yourself up. The next player has to break you down, so on and so forth. But more or less the whole card play tableau building, the way the market works was pretty similar. So they streamlined it a bit, but it still very much so feels like the same game to me. Okay. Yeah. Someone came up and saw us playing, was super interested and asked a few questions about it. And I think I commented that this is the game that Rising Sun wants to be. And it just, or it's like Rising Sun, but doesn't fail because... <laughs> I mean, I, I thought Rising Sun was pretty good. Not as good as most of the games in this list, though. Okay. I won't I won't harp nope. on Rising Sun too much. I've, I have done it a lot and I have only played it once, but... It has that feeling of on a small map, a very cramped map, trying to kind of slug it out with the other players. An interesting twist on Pax Pamir, though, is that most of the military and army strength are third parties. Yeah. They're third parties that you ally with and can change allegiances with throughout the game because one of the ways to almost certainly win or at least get a huge victory point boost is to have your allied faction be very dominant on the board and you have the most influence with that faction relative to the other players so you're trying to kind of like either boost your faction's position really well and kind of you know stay steady or jump on an accelerating bandwagon that someone else is working on and then yeah. try to and try to like be the the most influential rapidly it, it was super interesting as the board developed and i was surprised how quickly the third party faction influence went down mm-hmm. like by mid game there was a lot of roads in particular yes and and more roads than there there should have been. That was partly my fault. Yeah, a- according to people who commented walking by that the board was way more crowded than it usually is. So we probably weren't playing it as well as we should have been. Yeah. What was really interesting to me was I saw, forget who we were playing with. Um, I don't remember his name. I feel yeah, bad. W- one of the... Um, one of the enforcers who was teaching at, the, at that booth. He yeah. was very nice and super enthusiastic about the game. Yeah, he was awesome. So he originally was a part of the same faction that I was, but he quickly kind of saw an opportunity and changed. And then I forget what faction he went to, but that one... Rush. He went to the Russian. The Russian, Which was mine. Which was yours. And, and all of a sudden, like, Russia, like, was really bolstered up. And then you realize that you had no future there. Right, because Russia was doing super well. 
But the problem was I was second fiddle. I was, he was much more influential with them. So I realized like, even though I'm in the winning faction here, I can't personally win the game. So So I had to abandon it and then immediately start fighting Russia. So yeah. And so you joined the other Mark and you two were in a faction. Meanwhile, I was just a mess and my, you just sent spies everywhere. Well, yeah. So that's what happened. So I was just a mess and didn't really have a good position at all for the board i also didn't draft my tableau well for board control i'm sure we'll talk more about that but then i just decided i was going to abandon influence altogether and just dropped a buttload of spies (laughs) which was absolutely a legit strategy i was in contention for winning i i was never the top dog but i was a turn away from getting a victory condition a couple times just completely ignoring the influence and working with spies yeah because if one of the factions isn't leading by enough an influence then the points go to whoever has the most of their pieces on the board which while well, spies is one way to get them out there spies is also interesting because it gives you the option to potentially murder other people's cards in their tableau which is <laughs> fun unpleasant as well as if you have your spies on someone else's card they have to pay you to use the actions on it so there's a lot of really juicy mean decisions you can make and all centered around a simple card drafting system it's the small world system right there's except there's just three rows instead of one if you want a card further up you drop a coin on the ones before it like yeah. almost the whole game is centered around doing that Notably, also, there is a closed economy, so the coins you're putting down are going into someone else's pocket, and they sort of cycle around, so Mm -hmm. you end up with an ebb and flow of being poor and having to take cheap cards or cards with money on them, and then being wealthy and being able to make big plays. I don't know how he did it, but the guy who was playing with us towards the end game managed some amazing economy. He had probably two-thirds of the money in the game. Yeah, where he just, he was taxing like crazy or something. I don't. I, th- I think that's what it was. I think that he... Well, he had a card that made it so when he picked up certain cards, he didn't have to pay. Yes, he didn't have to pay. That's right. And then I think each card has a suit, and if and one suit is kind of active at a time. And so I think what happened, actually, is he had a, a handful of cards in that suit that gave him a tax action. So he ended up taking a bunch of money and then didn't have to spend it. And the rest of us were just poor and broke and couldn't take any expensive cards, which was really annoying. Yeah, yeah. the the suits on the cards are also really interesting because you kind of need to go for a little bit of everything. But what you are able to get opportunistically and what works for your strategy is tricky. So you need the blue cards to increase your hand size. You need the purple cards to increase your tableau size. Yellow cards will get you more money. Red cards will allow you to do military actions. And, you know, you do kind of need both purple and blue. And then what else you focus on is tricky. Yeah, honestly, after one play, I feel like going heavy into any one of those suits could be completely viable strategy. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to play this and play this potentially well. Yeah, which, well, is, which is really cool. You have to go into a suit that allows you to get pieces out is the thing but yes you can't go heavy military because you'll never get any of your own pieces out right um and you're just going to get drained because that's what i inadvertently did because i didn't quite understand the relationship between the different card suits and the type of actions they allow you yes when you place them or the the bonuses that they give right so i think i had the opposite problem of you is halfway through the game i realized i had zero actions that related to the board (laughs) <laughs> yes. and you were and just the, all spies and that's when i just you know well i just crowded than... the board with russians and then yeah. had no way to capitalize on that yeah but i mean at the end of the day here's here's what i'm going to say about pax premier i finished the game with zero victory points and i pre-ordered the game in the middle of playing yeah. <laughs> i was having that much fun if you're into staring at a complicated board state where everything kind of has a meaning and a secondary meaning and then trying to understand what everyone else is doing and processing all that information to make one decision on your turn or two decisions on your turn this is the game for you like it i had terrible ap on in this game i think this is more your cup of tea mark than than mine but just the, the intensity of 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 your turn trying to think of what do i need to do it really feels great yeah this is 
this is going to be a, an opaque game. It'll take a few plays to really understand how everything works together, especially because of the your pieces. You are not you are allied with, say, Britain or Russia, but you are not Britain or Russia, and the interaction between you and the factions that you may or may not be allied with and how to work that is very difficult to get but after a few plays you'll probably get it but that said compared to other highly interactive kind of deep war games i'm thinking of like the coin games this is a much simpler game to learn it has some of the coin feel but it is not as heavy or hard to get into as a coin game it's not nearly as obtuse for yes. sure you get you much more quickly get to thinking about what other people are doing rather than what you were able to do. Like you get past the point where you're like, oh man, what I get, what am I able to do here? And get to the point where you're actually strategizing much more quickly. I, I'm super excited to play it more and actually do well and do something that's uh, that's viable and, and able to score me points, but highly recommended. Finally, our number one game unanimously, and I think by a decent margin even over the, the over Pax Premier and Irish Gage, at least for me. Yeah, this is leaps and bounds better than everything else for me. This is a game that could easily hit my top 10, 15 once I play it a bit more and actually play with a production copy, and that is Pipeline. A Pipeline. A really intense, deep, perfect information, no randomness euro game the initial comparison i i come to when i think about pipeline is food chain magnate in yes. that it uh, is just brutally punishing if you don't think ahead enough and it's all about thinking ahead and planning out yeah. and trying to figure out a way to get a sequence of actions available to you to squeeze out efficiency and it does that in just the best way yeah it really does um I thought you were going to say Power Grid. The markets are similar to Power Grid. It has Grid. the same market, but I mean, in terms of the feeling of the game, yeah, it, the feels, feeling. it feels like a splatter game. It's really punishing. And like, I didn't do particularly well. I, I ended up coming in third. I and I scored more than I thought I would, but there were times where like, I'm like, oh man, I have to do this action this way. And it's so inefficient. But it's just because I didn't plan well enough. I may have run away with the game. Yeah, this yeah, was you the, did very this well. This was the game where I was like looking at admiring my little pipes. I was like, wow, I've I've really done well here. Then I look over and like Mark has just twice as much pipe line as I do. That and I was able to run my pipes for without using an action by pay, paying fifteen dollars. Dollars being your victory point, and you actually had fifteen dollars <laughs> and just made huge amounts of money over and over just running these pipes. Yeah, yeah, you you got your engine. Well, and also like Food Chain Magnate, the the points skyrocket towards the end of the game because you're building and building and building and building up this engine. Yeah, literally with machines with your pipe system to be able to pump out tons of money uh, at the end. I mean, the, the succinct way to describe Pipeline is: imagine if Vital Lacerda made a, a, a splatter game. That is very accurate, <laughs> right? It's got the complexity and, you know, it obviously it has the art from Ian O'Toole, which has done many or almost all of, of Lacerda's games. But it has that kind of brutal, punishing nature of a splatter game. Uh, it looks it looks incredible. So how it works is that you're, you're just taking oil, crude oil, and you're refining it and you're selling it for more money than you bought. But you start with hardly any money. There's this action selection system that's fairly simple worker placement stuff you're not blocked though so it's just kind of action selection but very quickly the implications of what you do early kind of branch out or, or at least the options available to you branch out and what you're trying to do is at first you're you're going to be getting a little bit of crude oil you stick it in your one of your bins that holds crude oil and then you buy some pipe and we'll talk about kind of the the puzzle aspect of laying these pipe tiles but you get enough pipe and you're able to refine the oil so you put your little dude down on the pipes and you refine the oil then you sell it for some money and then you actually have some money and can kind of start the game uh which is trying to build up a pipe infrastructure that is able to refine using these machines oil without spending an action and the fundamental tension in the game all across the board 
is between things that cost actions or things that do the same thing but cost money. So at the beginning of the game, you don't have money, so you have to keep spending actions. But you're trying to convert everything into a system where you spend money to get more money without spending nearly as many actions. Yeah. I, That's everything we got to say. Good night, folks. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I want to say about this that compared to many games of this weight, I felt like this was also fairly easy to teach and at least learn the rules of. Oh, I yeah. ended up yeah. learning it from I the rule book and teaching agree. them as well as teaching some random guy who came by and wanted to know how the game worked. But there is a huge amount of depth here. Uh, it's basically a worker placement game. Uh, and then, as you said, trying to convert, trying to increase your efficiency. There's also you can spend an action to sell your oil or you can take contracts that you sell oil to without an action, but then you're penalized if you can't fulfill those contracts. And there's just I feel like there's a lot of possible avenues you could take. How heavy you want yeah. to go into pipelines or machines? Do you want to go to upgrades or try to skip that? I'm sure Matt has something he wants to say about the upgrades. Yeah, the the upgrades were my least favorite um, part of the game, but <laughs> that may have contributed to me running away with the game. Let's not talk about the upgrades yet. There's like a, a little tech tree system. It they if you don't block people from getting the higher levels, they will get some very powerful abilities. Yeah, everything you guys are saying is is spot on. The game feels different than any other kind of similar like brutal efficiency game that i've ever played when you sit down like it's just gorgeous you see all this pipe laid out in the center of the board in in kind of interesting patterns and the colors are nice yeah uh, as in real life the, oil the three, three colors, colors of oil yes orange uh, white and teal teal, teal. yeah yes. no idea teal. what the different colors mean teal and why none of them are black <laughs> <laughs> so this puzzle of actually creating your pipe it almost feels out of place in a game of this magnitude. It's just so fun to place little tiles of tubes so that you you create, I don't know, like this tangled mess that has... You, you're trying to get certain lengths of s- certain colors of pipe because the length of the pipe, as we all know, determines how much refining it can do to one oil of that color. Here's the thing, though. I think the whole pipe puzzle thing is yeah. actually sneakily very thematic. Because, yeah, obviously in real life, the length of the pipe that oil travels through has nothing to do with the refining <laughs> process. But what you're actually doing with the pipe lane is you're testing your own ability to plan ahead and, like, operate efficient- efficiently as a, yeah. an oil yeah. refining company. And it's just a visual representation of your ability to think better and plan ahead better and be opportunistic which is how you would get ahead in a marketplace also sorry i just wanted to throw that about the the theming of it yeah no that that's great um it it adds a nice puzzly hook to the game in addition to it just being a worker placement convert resources type game too yeah and and honestly like the um multiple times in the game i found myself looking and like i would find three pieces of pipe that were adjacent in the government pipe board, which is important because you can only buy adjacent pipe in the government board. It's cheaper too, but you can only buy it adjacent. Um, and, yeah. I, and I'd be like, whoa, if I put that piece there, that piece there, that piece there, I just, now I can refine two different trains of oil simultaneously an extra level. I got to beat everyone else to that spot, you know, that, that sort of thing. But just, I don't know, having that weird pipe puzzle going on simultaneously, kind of in the background of this... just Buy a, low, a, a refine, fish, sell yeah, high. Yeah, market efficiency game is, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's just glorious. I love it. Yeah, and again, if you don't like unforgiving games, you're not going to like Pipeline. Like, it's it can be very unforgiving. Your score is going to be representative exactly of how well you played the game. Like, it's just one of those games that's going to be... There's no, like, catch-up mechanisms or any... Not, I mean, there's a tiny bit of randomness in what new pipes come out in one portion of the game, but that's the only bit of randomness. You know, so low luck, all the information's in front of you. You just have to play better to win. And, you know, I don't like all games that are like that, but this one is just... Every part of it is so fun. And 
like when I was playing, I, I realized I was not playing well, but I was seeing and discovering new, you know, decisions I could have made differently, new different interactions I didn't notice before. Like, I think the discovery process for getting like kind of good at the game is going to be so much fun. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can see if you had played like 15% more efficiently, you would have been playing like Mark over here. But if he had been playing 15% more efficiently, like your pipe... It would have run off the table even more than it did. <laughs> it, and it would have just been glorious how much oil you'd be refining. Yeah, I feel like I wasn't so much really good at laying the pipes down as that I just got a bunch of bonuses let me get a bunch of extra pipe. And I was just like, sure, I'll grab all these pieces and I'll find yeah. some place to stick them. <laughs> yeah. And so you, what did you have? Two machines at the end of the game? Yes. So that's possibly eight. I don't think you had eight refining pipes connected. But yeah, I what, screwed one six of them Six or up, seven? But... Seven? I think six. Six? Like, I, I don't know. Like, it, it was just awesome. Um, and, and you could just see how you go from spending basically the first entire year maybe doing one or two cycles of of refining and selling to like you were probably doing this like every turn every, every turn, turn i you was were refining selling. oil yeah. from like crude to highest grade and i could sell it the next turn and buy more and do it again i mean i tweeted this but if you're not on twitter you won't know the enthusiasm i had for this game after i played i said this is without a doubt the best 2018 slash 19 release i have played I'm standing by that. Yeah. I mean, is... I'm one of the people who thinks that 2018 was kind of a down year, yeah. but Pipeline is really, really good. Yeah, this is easily better than anything I played in 2018. This is, I don't think any amount of talking about it is going to do justice to just how great this game is. Yeah. Uh, I think among heavy Euro gamers, it's going to quickly become, you know, really well esteemed. I'm very sad I missed the pre-order slash Kickstarter period for I it. I know, yeah. I was aware of the game and I decided, is this going to be for me? I don't know. That was a mistake. <laughs> we said that the pipes look cool and all that, but it it really looks beautiful um, and sleek. I mean, we mentioned it before. It was Eno Tool again. Yeah, right. He's, yes. he's really good at it. Yeah. Just commenting generally on the games, I, I felt like the games we played looked really good overall. I was... I, would I think the, the top three and... Not a Luca would look good. Yeah, none of them look bad. I think also yeah. when we've got so many games coming out, that games have to start looking better just to stand yes. out from the crowd. Those drab euros that we had for you know five to ten years ago don't cut it anymore. It, as far as aesthetics, it's it's a aesthetics. great development that we can go to the new look section and and play games that look at least good. I mean, the ones that stood out were Coimbra, the climbers, kind of. Although that's just like blocks of color. I'd say Coimbra and Pipeline were looked really nice. Pax Mimir had had very good components with yes. that cloth map. That was amazing. Was I thought Symphony blocks. was excellent. Oh, it looks okay. San Francisco was probably the most boring looking. Yes, San mm-hmm. Fan was the, the most boring. Yeah. Pastali I mean, was Oh, Pastali had looked, looked really beautiful. I mean, honestly, Ma- Mega City Oceana looked good. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not saying that these were all like 10 out of 10s, but other than San Francisco, there weren't any just really drab experiences, I think. Eh, in, a lot in of them were, played, so. they were all medium to good. Yeah. yeah. Man, that we we have gotten through this, guys. I don't know how long this podcast is going to be when we we edit it, but we have gone for nearly two and a half hours, which is actually quicker than I thought we would. But that is our top, or those are all the games we played at PAX East 2019. I think for those going to one of the big packs like this, if you're into board games, I think sticking around the board game section yeah. for nearly the entire time is a great way to go. I feel substantially less burned out. I mean, this is the first year I've, I mean, I didn't make it all four days last year. And then I think even the year before that, I didn't make it all three days just from burnout from the convention. But when you're sitting there playing games, it's a lot less exhausting. It's less loud in the board game area. Yeah, my my faith in Pax is a little bit restored. I was starting to doubt whether I really wanted to keep doing this for multiple days, but it's it, it was pretty awesome. And the board game people are also awesome, especially if you're you're in like the first look area. Those mm-hmm. people are just excited about games, and yeah. friendly, and yeah. want to tell you about great games. Great yeah. members of the community curate that and run that, and it's just wonderful. It's fantastic. So thanks to all of them. If uh, any of them are listening, thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everybody. 
Don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com. Check me out on social media. I'm very active on Twitter. And uh, don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. If you would like to watch our podcast live and be part of our awesome community, our humble awesome community, I will say, uh, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Any and all contributions you guys give are greatly appreciated. Helps us keep going and be able to play and talk about more games. I think next podcast will be about a convention before this one, but don't worry about it. It's going to be like this one, a list of interesting games to talk about, including the hottest game of 2019, Wingspan. Uh, So stick around for that. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.